the um, stories today from Araya Vishnu um, by my godbrother Rupa Velastas and um, there's another book written by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's disciples <coughs> on the life and precepts of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. This is a little bit from that. <coughs> So Sula Prabhupada, Sula Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was also not known as Singha Guru or the Lion Guru. And as this book is called, A Ray of Vishnu. So we'll hear why he got those um, wonderful uh, names to glorify him. So he was one of ten children of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who we know is a pure exalted devotee. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur was serving as deputy magistrate in Puri at the time, and he was also supervising the uh, Lord Jagannath temple. So <clears throat> uh, he was feeling that he had been preaching like anything, but he was feeling a little uh, that it was a very daunting task. So he began to pray to the Lord that your teachings have been greatly depreciated and it is not in my power to restore them. So I am praying for you, for a son who will assist me in this matter, for a ray of Vishnu. <laughs> so <clears throat> when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was born on February 6th, 1874, which we're commemorating today. His umbilical cord was around the neck and the rest of the cord was sort of draped across his chest. So it just looks like, you know, it's the Brahman thread. So everyone was like, um, you know, in the uh, home when he was born in the maternity home, they were all, wow. <laughs> um, and then after six months, the Rathiatra came and the cart stopped outside the door. And, you know, sometimes the cart just stops and the devotees push and pull and they can't get it to move. So it stopped right outside Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's home. So his wife, um, Padmavati Devi, who was a beautiful Vaishnavi, she took her son onto the cart. And because, you know, they were all so respected, the pandas allowed that. And um, as she put the son near the feet of Lord Jagannath, the, uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta put out his arms towards the lotus feet of Lord Jagannath. And at that time a garland fell around his body. So the pandas said to him, said to her, well, you have a great devotee here. He's going to be a great devotee. <laughs> and uh, there was some realization of Bhakti Vinodhaka when he heard that story. He was thinking, ah, oh, this is my prayers answered. So he had some understanding so early on in Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's life that this was the answers to his prayers. So um, <clears throat> he, there's a story of um, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur and um, Padmavati Devi Dasi were very, what's it, Padmavati Bhakti? were very uh, strict about association and about eating. So they, they wanted their children to only have Krishna Prasad and they also didn't want them to associate with anybody who was um, not devotion or at all rough. You know, they, they were very careful about those things. So when um, Silu Bhakti Siddhanta was about three years old, he just took one mango and he, he ate it. And Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, when he found out, because everything in the house would get offered to the Lord, uh, so Srila Prabhupada explains that the rebuke that Bhaktivinoda Thakur gave to Srila Bhaktisiddhanta was very mild. He said, oh, you have taken this, but it was meant for the deities. And we offer everything to the deities, but the child took it terribly um, to heart. And he made a vow at three years old, he would never eat mango again. And Srila Prabhupada said that throughout his life, you know, whenever we would try to encourage him to eat mango, he would say, no, I am a fender, I cannot take. So he really took that to heart, even though he was so small. So these are all indications that he was very saintly. So when he was like almost a year, they moved to Bengal. And it's explained that the mother was always telling him stories of uh, Krishna. I think it was Bhagavati Devi, wasn't it, the wife? Yeah. yeah Bhagavati Devi, yeah, sorry. 
So, <clears throat> so by the time that Bimala Prasad, he was called Bimala Prasad, was seven years old, he could recite the whole Bhagavad Gita. And I, I do remember an incident in Bombay when Srila Prabhupada, it was in the evening for, for, Prabhupada, for the class, and there were some life members there, and they told Srila Prabhupada that their son could chant one whole chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So Srila Prabhupada got that boy up, and he made him recite the Bhagavad Gita, and he was so pleased. And I was thinking about that, that he would have remembered that his own guru could recite the whole thing. But not only could Srila Bhakti Siddhanta recite the whole Bhagavad Gita, he could explain it <laughs> at seven. So. Knowing his, he could, Sula Bhaktivinotaka was very aware, so he started to teach him about printing and um, editing. And, you know, like for right from the word go, he didn't think, oh, he's just a little boy. You know, he just treated him as a fellow Vaishnava, uh, instructing him, but also, you know, making sure that he um, was very confident at service that Sula Bhaktivinotaka was hoping that he would perform later. So um, then he went to school, and uh, he was in class. When he was in class five, he was so clever that he devised a new method of writing. He gave it a name and devised it. So he was like brilliant, and it's described that he, he wasn't very interested in his worldly lessons, but he he knew them, even though he didn't appear to be not very interested. He was always you couldn't ask him anything that he he didn't know, because once he'd heard something. He knew it, and that was a feature of his life. If he heard something, he could remember it. Shoot it out. He could remember it all through his life. So he had a, they, you know, they call it a photographic memory these days, but he had a perfect memory. <clears throat> so he passed uh, his entrance exams in 1892 and was admitted into a Sanskrit college of Calcutta. But there, he spent his, a lot of his time in the library, and any book on philosophy, he was eagerly read it cover to cover. So he was always very curious about different philosophies and wanted to become well-versed in them. <clears throat> so uh, he also studied um, Sanskrit and astrology. And he became very well-versed in Sanskrit by the time he was 25 in Sanskrit mathematics and astronomy. And he also published many, many magazine articles and a book on astronomy called Surya Siddhanta. It was from the Vedas, and he published that. So he was given the name Siddhanta Saraswati in recognition of his great erudition. <clears throat> then he accepted service in 1895 under one um, in the Tripura royal government as an editor. And he was writing the life histories of the royal line. <clears throat> so after a, a some time, he also took various responsibilities of inspecting ongoing activities in the royal palace. So he took this all up, but he, he found that the political side of life very um, egregious and you know, he found envy and malice and corruption surfacing everywhere. So he, he developed an aversion to state affairs and he resigned. But the Maharaj was so happy with him that he continued to give him a pension. But after three years, he gave that up also. <clears throat> so, uh, so at one stage, he, um, he went um, with his father on a pilgrimage to various holy places, Kashi, Prayag, and Gaya. And at Kashi, there was a great lengthy discussion um, held about the Ramanuja Sampradaya. And it's explained that after that, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's life kind of took a turn. He became very much renounced after that. Um, and he, began, he was really searching for a guru. So regarding a guru, a, a Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur could understand, and he suggested to him um, that he take Gaura Kishore Das Babaji. So Gaura Kishore Das Babaji, like Babaji's in those days were real Babaji's, and uh, he was a um, shining example of a Babaji who was completely renounced. And um, <clears throat> there's some pretty um, 
interesting stories about Gora Kishore's renunciation. He used to live under a boat because he didn't want to live in a house. And then when he got a few accolades from people, he decided to live just right by the stool house so that people wouldn't bother him. <laughs> so he was very renounced. But he was a beautiful devotee and he was always chanting Hare Krishna. So he hardly ate. He wore abandoned clothes of dead bodies. Dead bodies floating down the Ganga. <laughs> and he generally ate plain rice soaked in Ganga water, garnished with a little chili and salt. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, on the advice of his father, went to beg Gorakishwar Gaur Das Babaji for initiation because he wouldn't initiate anyone. He was so averse to any sort of pratishta or any acclamation. But um, Gorakishwar Das said, well, next time I'm speaking to Mahaprabhu, I'll ask him. And um, so then um, he said, I can't give it to you without the approval of Lord Chaitanya. So when he returned, Srila Gorakishwar said, oh, I forgot to ask Mahaprabhu. And then again he came. And this time Gorakishwar stated that Mahaprabhu had said, erudition is extremely insignificant in comparison to devotion to the Supreme Lord. Because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was such an erudite scholar. But... Um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta replied that since you, Gorakishore, are the servant of the supreme deceiver, then um, you must be testing Saraswati by withholding this consent. And, but he remained very firmly determined to take him as his guru because he could see he's a real Vaishnava. He was always searching for Vaishnavas, he even wrote a book, Vaishnava K, what is a Vaishnava? So he was, um, he knew that Gorakishore Das Bhavati was a completely pure Vaishnava. And the, the fact that he was illiterate did not bother him at all. So it's such a contrast, you've got someone who's illiterate and you've got this erudite scholar begging for his uh, mercy. So. In the end, Gorkishore was very impressed because he was so committed. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was so committed to taking Gorkishore as his guru that he finally gave in. And uh, he uh, initiated him. When he initiated him in Godruma, he told him, preach the absolute truth and keep aside all other works. So... <clears throat> Uh, so now he, uh, he had this formal initiation. So he accompanied Srila Bhakti Vinod on a pilgrimage in 1900. <clears throat> and they went to Balasore, Remuna, Bhubaneswar and Puri. So Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur instructed Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Saraswati to give Chaitanya Charitamrita classes wherever they went. And the purports were so profound that he gave that everyone who heard it was like turned, you know, impressed and moved. So that was the, so in other words, his, he wasn't erudite, just erudite, but he was um, realized. So his purports and the way he spoke them were so sort of attractive to people that um, it caused many to change their lives. So it's explained that <clears throat> through this initiation, <clears throat> initiative of Bhakti Thakur to have Srila Bhakti Siddhanta um, delivering lectures and giving his purports, it's explained the flow of pure bhakti began to inundate the world. <laughs> so in 1905, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta took a vow to chant the Hare Krishna mantra a billion times. So there's a reason for this. <coughs> so <coughs> we know that we can't just get Krishna's mercy by demanding it. We know that Krishna's mercy, there's the descending, descending process, not ascending process. And we can't earn it. But Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was aware of the power of um, performing austerities um, for the pleasure of the Lord. So he wanted to become 
purified by chanting these billion names. So it took some years. And he sat in a hut that the roof leaked. So when it rained heavily, he just put up an umbrella. And he just lay down on the floor. He hardly ate. And he just chanted day and night until he had completed this vow. So then he felt like, he felt like, I feel like I've done some cleansing that I can preach more. The idea was he wanted to take up the preaching mission, but he wanted to feel that he had performed some austerities to gain the mercy of, the blessings of Krishna's holy name and Lord Karanga. So, so he during this time uh, in Bengal, there were many sort of Sahaja sects, such as Aul, Baal, Kartabhaja, Nida, Nida, Daravesha, Sain, etc. And they followed worldly practices in the name of spiritualism. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati launched a severe attack on them, on all these bogus sects, uh, because he, and he didn't spare anyone who deviated from Lord Chaitanya's teachings because he knew they deviated and, and he wanted to... Um, and they, they had gained a bad name for Vaishnavism because people knew they weren't actually sincerely following. They were rascals and they were propounding these philosophies. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati wanted to re-establish the good name of Vaishnavism as Bhakti Vinod Thakur had been doing. So <clears throat> he, uh, he did gain some enemies <laughs> amongst these groups, of course, because he was a powerful preacher and nobody could defeat him. So once he had his eyes on a, a particular faulty sect, then <laughs> they were in trouble. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so it really grieved him to see what they were doing and that they were misleading people. So he dis dissociated himself with all these various gurus and, and he resorted to performing his bhajan in solitude. So uh, he, so his father, in 1911 his father was ill and um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati took up a um, challenge against pseudo-Vaishnavas who were, um, sorry, Brahmanas, who were claiming their exalted position and their superiority against um, Vaishnavas. So it was a very caste-conscious community at that time. And a lot of those caste-conscious people had become very incensed by both Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur's preaching and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's preaching. So, <clears throat> because they had set out with many scriptural proofs to prove that anyone, regardless of birth or caste, could become a Brahmana Vaishnava. So, <clears throat> because of this, the, the smarter Brahmanas arranged a discussion uh, and they invited Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur uh, didn't have good health at the time so he sent his son and first of all he got his son to read out you know, some of the things, points he was going to make and on his sick bed when he heard his son's erudite defeating of their bogus philosophy he was elated just to hear that so he sent off his son and uh, it's described that also Srila Gorakishwar Das Babaji was sitting quietly in the back. <laughs> so that was a, um, a three-day discussion that the Smartas were having. And um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, when he delivered his speech, the first thing he did was begin quoting Vedic references glorifying the Brahmanas. So that the Brahmanas' chests were coming puffed up, you know. They were so happy to hear all this. And, uh, but then he started discussing what qualifications a Brahmana has. Not just, you know, the form of the Brahman threat around them. And uh, so he, they started to become a little less joyful. <laughs> and 
when he just described the, the qualities of a Vaishnava and the relationship between a Vaishnava and a Brahmana, then you know they were they were very disappointed. All their joy disappeared. Uh, so this um, talk that Shri Bhakti Siddhanta gave was very um, influential and. People, the people at that talk were so happy. Um, even Srila Gora Kishodas Babaji sitting on the back, he was like, he was saying, oh, that's my Prabhu. <laughs> it's his disciple who's saying, that's my Prabhu. <laughs> and the people there were so pleased um, that um, they took the, they washed Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's Saraswati Thakur's feet and were splashing out the water, but people were like mad after it. Everybody had to have some, they were <laughs> insistent. So they added some water to that and made sure that everybody got this water on their heads because they were so impressed with Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's devotional service and with his um, complete smashing of the Smarta Brahmanas and upholding the position of Vaishnavas. So it was a real victory for Vaishnavism. So, Srila Bhakti Thakur, his father passed away in 1914 on Gadadhar Pandit's uh, disappearance day. And on the evening of that, he preached to his son, he instructed his son to preach the teachings of the six Goswamis and Lord Chaitanya far and wide. And he also requested Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati develop the birth site of Lord Gauranga. So they were instruct in his instructions. And Bhagavati Devi disappeared a few years later, and before her passing, she held the hands of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Goswami and implored him to preach the glories of Lord Gauranga and Lord Gauranga's dham. So what wonderful parents <laughs> and what a wonderful son. So, and then his spiritual master, Gorka Shordas Babaji, left a year later. So, at that time, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, having lost that wonderful association of his father and his spiritual master, uh, he manifested great pangs of separation. And there's a nice story. Uh, in this book. It's a wonderful story. Srila Prabhupada, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, was feeling very discouraged in the absence of his guru and his father. Seeing the helpless, helpless condition of the spiritual section in the country and the propaganda of the Sahajas, he was thinking, how will I fulfill the desire of my spiritual masters? How will I be able to preach the message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? I do not have enough money or manpower, nor do I have any knowledge or talents that will enchant the public. I have no material skill or wealth. How can this grave task be performed by me? I won't be able to preach the message of my spiritual masters. Thinking all this, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta displayed his pastime of some depression. Then one night he saw in a visionary trance that Lord Gorasunda had arrived from the east side of the Yoga Pit temple with his associates. Amid the sound of Sankirtan, he was ascending to his birth site. With him were the six Goswamis, Srila Jagannath Das Babaji, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Srila Gorakishoda Das Babaji were also present in their effulgent transcendental forms. Addressing Srila Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta directly, they said, Why are you in such a state of anxiety? Begin your task of establishing pure religion. Everywhere, preach the message of Sri Gora and spread the service of the holy name, abode, and desire of Lord Sri Gora. We are always ready to help you, being eternally present with you. In your mission of establishing pure devotional service, you will always receive our help. Behind your innumerable people, behind you, innumerable people, unlimited wealth, and extraordinary scholarship are waiting to help you. Whatever you need at any time will immediately appear to serve your mission of pure devotion. 
with full enthusiasm, proceed with your preaching of the message of pure devotion as it was preached by Sriman Mahaprabhu. No material problems can impede you. We are always with you. And the next morning he told all his disciples about this with great ecstasy. So then he felt like there were no barriers. And then he really um, began preaching very, very strongly. <clears throat> so, so he assumed editorship of Sadhana Toshani and he established uh, a Bhagwat Press in Krishnanagar. And uh, in 1918, in Mayapur, he sat down before a picture of Gaur Kishore Das Babaji and initiated himself into the sannyas order. <laughs> At that time, he assumed the title Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj. So, <clears throat> he was constantly preaching all over India at this time. He was lecturing to crowds of thousands. He was debating. He was destroying bogus religious sects. Uh, he was performing parikram in different sacred sites. <clears throat> uh, he was improving and preserving various holy places. For example, he installed 108 places uh, footprints of Lord Chaitanya in 108 places that Lord Chaitanya had visited during his sannyas life and there he put the date that Lord Chaitanya had visited there. And he attracted many elevated disciples from highly respectable families. So, you know, the, the sort of the face of Vaishnavism began to change with Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's strong preaching. He lectured at many major temples and pastime places uh, he brought new spiritual insights into the life of many thousands, bringing them under Lord Chaitanya's banner. In many states, he was received as an honored guest, and he was asked to speak in public by the leaders. And he met many uh, of the English as well, too, and they were also very respectful towards him, because, of course, at this time, the English were ruling India. And he gathered um, various authentic manuscripts and began publishing them. So, <clears throat> so when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada's disciples would come, then sometimes in some places, the, because of the caste brahmana stirring trouble, there'd be an uproar against them and shopkeepers would close their shops so that um, they wouldn't be able to purchase anything. <laughs> So he wasn't without enemies at all. And um, <clears throat> there was opposition because a lot of these um, people were born in you know, low-class families and people just couldn't get their head around it because of that grip of the caste system on them. And in Navadvip, uh, the, they, the, Brahman, the caste Brahmanas attempted to bribe the deputy magistrate the police magistrate, sorry, and uh, he absolutely refused. He said, we do take bribes, but there's no way I'm going to take a bribe against such a holy person. And he warned Sula Bhakti Siddhanta. And at that time, um, Sula Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, who was his disciple and who looked thin and tall like him, he took saffron cloth and um, Sula Bhakti Siddhanta, because his disciples insisted, they're trying to kill you, you must go. And so he left, and um, Pragyan and Keshav Maharaj took that role in the same glasses and everything, so that if someone was going to be killed, he was going to be killed. <laughs> so, um, in 1922, Sula Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was preaching on top of a Calcutta residence and um, a friend of Sula Prabhupada's Narendra Modi, I think, insisted that Sula Prabhupada come and see this saintly person, but he was like, uh-uh, I'm not going to go see him. I've had enough of sadhus. And Prabhupada says, in two lectures that I listened to, Prabhupada said, I, because of bad association, I was feeling like I didn't want to know about it anymore. Because his father had had many uh, um, sadhus, sadhus, come to his place 
and feed them. He would feed them every day. And Srila Prabhupada was, you know, a child, he saw this, but he wasn't impressed with them. So he just got to that point where he was, he said, I'm not interested, you know, I've had it with those saintly people. <laughs> but this Narendra Modi insisted, and Prabhupada said, he dragged me there. And as soon as they walked in and offered obeisance, Dr. Siddhanta said, oh, you're educated young people, why don't you begin to um, preach this message of Lord Chaitanya Sarao? Uh, in English. And, um, you know, Prabhupada was so shocked, you know, because he was a follower of Gandhi at the time, and he was wearing the khadi cloth, and he'd renounced his um, <clears throat> college degree uh, because the English had, you know, instigated the college degrees, and he burnt his. And so he said, oh, no one will hear, who will hear us? We're a dependent nation. And Srila Bhaktisiddhanta defeated him, and he said to him that, um, the message of Krishna is not dependent on any government, you know, it's far beyond that, and he defeated him. So, <clears throat> Sula Prabhupada said that, he said, at that time, I accepted him in my heart, not formally, but in my heart. And so when his friend asked, well, what did you think? He said, Sula Prabhupada said, oh, the uh, teachings of Lord Chaitanya are in the hands of a very wonderful, capable person. <coughs> so <coughs> he only associated with Sula Bhakti Siddhanta not very often. I was going to tell one thing. Sula Bhakti Siddhanta had many women disciples as well. And <coughs> when I was living in <coughs> Bombay, the daughter of one of those women disciples became <coughs> a friend. And she and four of her daughters took initiation from Sula Prabhupada. But the interesting thing is that when Sula Bhakti Siddhanta was in Calcutta or around close, Sula Prabhupada would go visit him, of course. And <clears throat> when he met Indureka, he called her, she walked into the room and Sula Prabhupada said, Oh, I remember you from that program with Guru, Guru Maharaj. And she was like overwhelmed because she had been six years old. <laughs> and he remembered her because soul's a soul. And um, <clears throat> Indu Rekha told me that her mother was a very dedicated disciple always. And um, somehow they lived near a lake. Somehow they had this crocodile, they found this baby crocodile, so they stuck it in the bath until it could be relocated. And so she sat beside this, Indureka's mother, sat beside this crocodile and chanted her 64 rounds. And she was telling the crocodile, don't you take another crocodile birth? And she sat there and chanted her 64 rounds to the crocodile. <laughs> So, and when she let, when she was leaving and unable to chant, she had Indurega sit beside her and chant her 64 rounds, and then keep the beads under her. So he had many disciples, women disciples as well. He wanted to put a, actually an ashram to have an ashram built in um, Navadvi for the women, so that they could be protected there and perform their service for those that were, didn't have husbands. They were widows or they, you know, hadn't married. So he was concerned for them. And that's was a story about that in this book. So, so Srila Prabhupada wrote to um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta one month before Srila Bhakti Siddhanta actually left his body. And he, he asked him, would, please will you give me an instruction? So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta gave him the same instruction. I want you to preach in English in the, to the Westerners preach this Krishna consciousness. That will do good to you and to those who hear it. So Sula Prabhupada was like, oh wow, that's the same instruction. And he actually approached his god brothers after Sula Bhakti Siddhanta left. And he said, look, I've got this letter and Sula Bhakti Siddhanta has told me this. And uh, they encouraged him, yes, you should preach in the Western world. So he had, he had his god brother's encouragement and he had Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's instructions there. So he became very focused. And it was on Srila Bhakti, this day, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's uh, appearance day in 1944, that Prabhupada first uh, um, 
had 1,000 1, copies of his Back to Godhead printed on this day as an offering to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. <coughs> and when, oh, I was just going to tell you also when uh, we were living in um, Kata, my preaching, uh, we, we used to go and visit this devotee called Yagyapati, who was a beautiful devotee. Uh, and at the time, he, at, he knew Srila Bhakti Siddhanta because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta used to come to Katak every year uh, for, for several years. And Yagyapati at the time was just a boy. He was like 14 when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta started coming there. And he asked Yagyapati, oh, will you um, write for me in Aurea? You know, will you, when I, if I, when I dictate, will you write in Aurea? And he was like, yes, and he was so enthusiastic. So I'd go to school in the day and afternoon, afternoon and evening, he'd spend with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So he, he told us that actually Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was so affectionate to him. He said, I loved him. He was so affectionate to me. So, you know, you kind of get this impression, I always got this impression, you know, he's very distant, you know, lion, Singha guru. But actually his disciples and this boy, you know, he would tell us how wonderful and kind and compassionate he was. And the same thing from his disciples, despite that erudition and that very uh, strong renunciation, he was also very compassionate and very loving. So we were always glad to, you know, have met um, Yagi Pati and to have kind of got that impression that he had as a boy. <clears throat> so, Srila Prabhupada took sannyas in 1959. Why did he take sannyas in 1959? Because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had come to him once, twice, thrice in dreams and insisted, you should take sannyas and take up the preaching more. So, Siddha Prabhupada, you know, like, even the first and second time, he was like, oh, how horrible, have to renounce your family. Even though he wasn't living with his family, uh, he wasn't thinking that that would be a very nice situation. And he said, he said to the devotees once, he said, oh, I, I didn't want to give up my family, you know, I didn't want to give up my children, he said, um, but after I gave up, now I have thousands of children, he said, <laughs> the devotees. Um, so he, he then took sannyas because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta had urged him. So in other words, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta kept on instructing him. Didn't matter that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta wasn't there in person. And Srila Prabhupada also, I was just listening the other day, he was, um, after he printed the third of the first cantos, one, two, and three, when he had number three printed, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta came to him and he said, now you, are, now you can go to America. Now you have these books printed, you can take them and go to America. So he was getting these instructions all the time from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta to push on this preaching movement. <laughs> so, um, he, um, yeah, so when we sort of think about um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's contribution, it was just immeasurable because everything was, you know, Srila Bhakti Vinotaka was trying to re-establish what real Vaishnavism is, but it was such a task. But Srila Bhakti Siddhanta took that up and ran with it. He had temples all across, in 64 temples all across India, he established what real Vaishnavism is. And he did so much, you know, in various holy places. He just had, did so much preaching work. And it, we are only here because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati instructed Srila Prabhupada to go to the Western world and preach this movement. Otherwise, we all would have been totally in ignorance. <laughs> so his contribution is immeasurable. And so on days like today, we, c we can feel so much gratitude to this great Acharya who appeared and changed everything within India, but also changed everything within the world because of his instruction to his disciples. So we have a lot to be grateful for today uh, in Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, um, the great 
uh, lion guru, great Vaishnava, who uh, has spread Krishna consciousness. Because of him, Krishna consciousness has spread and keeps on spreading. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to thank you very much. And um, if anybody has some contributions, request. <laughs> Also today there will be a program from 10 o'clock on where we um, speak, we read different things about Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and we intersperse it with bhajans. We always do that on these days. Oh, sorry, sorry, the, Krishna Rupa has the microphone just now, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for that um, wonderful class and glorification of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Just a couple of things that I was thinking of when you were, you were giving the class. Um, uh, when Bhakti Shitanda Saraswati Thakur was chanting those billion names, it took him nine years. Nine years. For such dedication and determination. And um, also, speaking to his kindness, uh, you were talking about his approachability. And, and in Leela Rita, it describes how Prabhupada, one of the five or six times through the through Prabhupada, met Bhakti Shitanda Saraswati Thakur. He, um, Bhakti Shivanda Saraswati, gave him a little coat for his, one of his sons. <laughs> and they went for a walk together and he gave him a little present, a gift for his son. Which so nice. And also, Prabhupada's um, own sister, Baba Truly, took initiation from Bhakti Shivanda Saraswati Thakur. Yeah. I, I don't know if she took first and second, but I know she took first initiation. And uh, when you were talking about the assassination, uh, not attempt, but they were planning on assassinating like Dissidanta Saraswati Thakur, it reminded me of when um, the Muslims first attacked my poor, and I was there during that um, attack. And when Prabhupada heard about it, he wasn't in my poor at the time, and when Prabhupada heard about it, he said, oh, they came for the old man. <laughs> They said they found a deadly snake because we had a shot, shotgun right. to defend ourselves with. Um, and it's one other thing, but you know, I can't think of it now. Yeah. All right, thank you. I just wanted to uh, thank you for the class. I just wanted to know um, if it was a billion, you know how there's like old scale and new scale, like if it's a thousand million or a million million. A million million. Wow. <laughs> Took nine years. <laughs> a thousand, a thousand, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, these three different questions. One is that, um, What's the Shastri preference and significance, if you could uh, elaborate a bit more, when the garland falls, when one is making a prayer or a flower falls, um, when we are uh, taking darshan of the deities, and the other one was um, the dreams, when there's dreams about the spiritual master and Krishna, and the third one is about um, that Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati Thakur was very erudite in scholarship and his spiritual master was not educated in material education. So when is it that one would, uh, is it based on their nature where they just focus, whether it's they pursue material education and utilize it in Krishna's service, the Yukta Bhairagya, or whether they just simple and they dedicate their full life to Krishna. So what is the consciousness behind those? Uh, well, there's Bhajananandi and Goshyanandi, and both are pure. They're both sort of. They're both in the pure devotee category. So the Bhajananandi was Gokishore, that he uh, he just chanted and worshipped Krishna, and full stop. You know, he he didn't go. He his bhajan was his own private bhajan. But he would, you know, he, he had many talks with Srila Bhakti Vinodhaka, but he was a private person. He didn't go out in front of many people to, to, to speak ever. 
he, he just didn't do that. That wasn't his thing. He was just humble and and um, completely like absorbed in the holy name. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta could respect that. One time, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, he said, well, will I say that a pure devotee thinks of Krishna um, 23 hours and 50 minutes or something? 55 minutes, 59 minutes? No, that is not a pure devotee. Pure devotee is thinking of Krishna 24 hours a day, and he was referring to Shiva Gorakishore Das Babaji because he was completely conscious always of Krishna. It was like in that third, you know, the, he, he, the third platform, the, the Kanishta, the Madhyam, the Uttama, Uttama Adhikari. So that was just his very high level, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Srila Bhakti Nautaka, they knew that. So he took him. And, um, but Srila Bhakti, Bhakti Siddhanta was instructed by him, you go and preach. It's not like he said, you have to retire. No, he wanted him to utilize his education and erudition to preach. That's why he was so proud of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta when he was sitting in the back of that, oh, my Prabhu, because he, you know, he wanted him to do it, but he, that wasn't his um, kind of mood. His mood was different. And regarding flowers falling when the deities, you know, we often take that, but, you know, that sometimes you get a sign, you know, I think a lot of devotees have that experience, you know, but I, I don't know if Shastibli about it, but definitely all the pandas agreed when they saw that, the child reaching and the garland coming, they all agreed. It was like a, one of those moments, like, wow. <laughs> and the dreams, um, It's a little difficult in dreams because sometimes our dreams are mixed up and, you know, silly things, um, mixed up with spiritual things. So, if the instruction, if the instruction that comes in a dream is conducive, then then we can follow it anyway because it's not it's allied with our sadhana and instructions. If it is, then it's good. It's like a, an affirmation. But if it's not, then you wouldn't take that very seriously. So that's, that's my understanding. Because sometimes you have just stupid dreams and you think, oh, I'm not going to listen to that. But sometimes you have one where Prabhupada might come and say something and you think, oh, wow, that's very, you know, that's perfect for me to hear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember that other point that I wanted to mention. I knew it would come up to the surface. Uh, when, when you were saying how... Um, Bhakti Shadanta decided but to continue to give instruction to the Srila Prabhupada even after his departure. I remember when um, it's described that when Prabhupada first returned to Mayapur, you know, after the establishment of this gun in the West and came back to Mayapur, some of his god brothers were criticizing him because he didn't stop um, on his journey to Mayapur Chandra going on there. He didn't stop at um, Bhakti Shadanta Thakur's um, Samadhi. And then when that information came just through the Prabhupada that his godbrothers weren't very pleased, Prabhupada said, my Guru Maharaj has never left me. He's always there in my heart. He's okay. never left. Okay. Which was, you know, really wonderful. Yeah. And just another point with the dreams. Um, when one dreams of the spiritual master, you know, it's not a nonsensical dream, when one dreams of the spiritual master, it's giving some instruction that's generally considered that is your spiritual master is appeared in, um, in the dream to specifically advise you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He did 192 rounds a day for nine years. Yeah, just over nine years. It won't be again. So Hari Dastaka was doing that many every day, exactly. right? Yeah, same thing. Gosh. Three blocks of 64. <laughs> wow. 
Oh, glorious. Jai. Thank you very much. Jai Srila Bhakti Sadam Tisaraswati Thakur Ki Jai.